establish local limits. Uh, and we can discuss those with you as we go. Uh, I do have Kim Cole here. She's our pretreatment <coughs> consultant, and she'll walk you through uh, a number of slides in the time that we have. Uh, if you have questions that she or I can't answer, Jeremy Lay's also in the audience with us from Bartlett and West, uh, Craig Samick, our pretreatment coordinator, and Joe Fontenot, our wastewater superintendent. So uh, with that, I think I will turn it over to Kim. You do have a handout there that you kind of reference if it's useful. Yes, so the idea being that um, I'm gonna walk you through some slides. Um, I've got about 20 slides of content, and if you're interested, I've got more slides of data. Um, but the handout is kind of, I told Pete, it's kind of like his homework. Um, you can kind of digest it a little bit and try to understand at a deeper level um, what we're trying to get at here. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. So the agenda, just like Mark said, why are we here? Um, it's just to update you on where we're at with this process. It's been long, it is a long process, um, but I hope that from the communication we've done with you guys and with the industries, you have a pretty good feel um, for where we're at and why um, we're to this point in the process. Um, I'll just refer you to your handout a little bit. Um, the handout starts out with definitions and gives you some background. Um, and then on the back side of that sheet, I also tried to summarize kind of what the issues are and some questions that you might have. Um, and then for reference, I included two attachments. The first one is one that I made in March um, a few months ago that gives you even more background if you want it. Um, and then the last sheet is attachment two. Um, we decided to call that the allocation policy approach. Um, with the kind of closing summary after I'm done today that we need to determine what to do with the ordinance that, we're, um, that we've been working on with the developing allowable industrial loads. So let me take you uh, through this presentation and we'll just see where you wanna spend more time after we get through it. So um, again, Historically, um, a lot of the graphs I have at the end go back to 2016, and you can look at that data and see from 2016 um, through current, we've had increased loadings at the wastewater treatment plant, which is why we have a more urgent need to be able to have the legal authority um, to issue permits to industries which limit what they're allowed to send. Historically, they've been able to send what they want, they just have to pay for it with a surcharge. So the ultimate goal is to figure out how to implement the city code that we've been working on. So just to kind of give you a quick overview of where we've been, um, back in, was it November? City Council endorsed the pretreatment program modifications that included the city code. Um, there's something called an enforcement response plan, which gives the city a method to implement the pretreatment program. Um, there were also local limit calculations where we calculated the allowable industrial load. Um, these definitions are on your handout. The allowable industrial load is what <coughs> you get after you subtract your domestic, and um, your domestic reserve, which is for houses and general residents, the general population. Um, so that, those modifications were endorsed by city council in November, then they went on public notice on December 15th and they were public noticed for 60 days. Um, DNR requires a 30 day public notice, so we went further. We also had some public meetings um, where the general public was invited to come and learn about the, the code updates. Um, DNR um, hasn't received any comments from that public notice process. Um, we have a few minor revisions that we wanna try to incorporate, um, which gives the city more solid legal authority um, for taking photos and videos if they're at an industrial facility. So that's why we've delayed that actual approval process a little bit. Um, but the next step after DNR formally approves the program changes is for city council to adopt um, the changes. And after that, we have to figure out how to actually implement that city code. Can I just ask real quick? Yes. On the local limits and the MAIL? Yes. That's all within city limits then? Um, it, okay. is, it is all based off of the MAHLs, what the Headworks is allowed to receive, and it's up to the city to decide how to allocate that allowable loading. So um, you'll see as we get into that, into this discussion, we have to allocate to the sister cities and we have to allocate to the industries and we have to make sure that Sioux City has what it needs as well. So that's what I've tried to do 
um, with these calculations. Thank you. Good question. So just to quickly summarize, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. We've been through it, but um, right now, Sioux City issues permits for, to industries for three years. This will let them go up to five years. Um, right now, we specify based on flow what you have to monitor for and the frequency. The code updates will allow you to identify pollutants of concern for each industry and mod modify that um, monitoring frequency kind of based on the fluctuation that we've seen in that industry. Um, there's a significant non-compliance definition that we've updated um, to match the federal requirements. Um, right now, with the new authority, you'll be able to put numerical limits in the ordinance. Currently, it says NA for all the permit limits. This will give you the authority to be able to put a number in there. Um, we updated the code to align with the FOG code that was passed a few years ago. So we've made those limits match for industries and for food service establishments. Um, and then there's also kind of some placeholders for surcharges, which is one of the next steps that we need to take. <coughs> so just to elaborate on that a little bit, right now the city surcharges for um, three parameters, BOD, TSS, and TKN, um, and there, yeah, there's some descriptions of BOD, TSS, and TKN in the definitions. Um, I'm sorry, I might have said that wrong. BOD, TSS, and FOG is what the city currently surcharges for. What we're recommending um, based on the evaluation of the program is that the city also start implementing a surcharge for TKN. Um, and then the other change is that we're giving industries the option to do a 12 month rolling average to try to um, smooth out the billing fluctuations that they see. Just to touch on oil and grease a little bit, um, like I mentioned earlier, we've aligned the limits. Um, it's double what EPA recommends. EPA by default says 100. Our monthly average is, it's a monthly average of 200 and we go up to a max day of 400. A lot of programs I work with limit fog at 100. So the city's being pretty lenient on what they see in the collection system. Um, really a lot of a fog program is implementing best management practices, which means keep it out of the collection system. Don't put it in there to begin with. And I think Mark is trying to come up with some incentives to uh, get industries to, or, and food service establishments to separate that oil and grease and haul it to the treatment plant. When you have grease in the collection system, it can clog the lines and cause sewage to overfill. And then that's, um, you have raw sewage into waters of the United States, which is a violation of the Federal Clean Water Act. So it's a pretty big deal. So it's important to take good care of your FOG program. And also um, to touch on sister cities a little bit, um, when I had a discussion with uh, EPA the other day, he um, he supported the decision that FOG programs are a collection system issue, not a pretreatment program issue. For, so for Sioux City, he agreed that the sister cities are responsible for FOG in that sister city jurisdiction, which I've been saying, and Paul said he was willing to put that in writing if you guys need it. So I, I think it's logical that each sister city would be responsible to implement their own FOG program. And ha have you talked to him about that? To, I talked to EPA about that. No, to the to sister, sister cities. cities. It's on the list of discussion items. So right now we are drafting sister city discussions and it's an item that we'll have to specifically address with them. They would have to develop something to take care of the fog in their... Yeah, because if there was an... Over, exactly, if there was an overflow in their collection system, it would be their violation, not Sioux Cities. And currently we, because we have the permit, are responsible for reviewing, I mean, that's what we have been doing. That's been the interpretation. The, um, the pretreatment program itself means Sioux City was, the, the, the impression was that Sioux City was supposed to implement the FOG yeah. program for the whole sewer service area. It didn't make sense to me, and I confirmed it with Paul Marshall at EPA Region 7, and he said he would support that in writing. So. And that was also the expectation of the sister cities that we would handle their FOG program. They don't have the personnel or the expertise uh, doesn't mean they shouldn't be doing it, and I the certainly think that that uh, it deserves a lot of conversation with them. Um, they may resist that, but we do now now have. I wouldn't say it's a reversal, but a difference of opinion from EPA that uh, they would support that we're only concerned about fog in our system. Yes, it doesn't really impact us what happens in those sister cities. So, right. Thank you. Yep, just a, a point to negotiate and to, to discuss further. 
actually, Mark, you should have stayed up here. Um, this is a cost of service study, which I haven't been involved in, so I was gonna ask Mark to provide an update on that. Sure, we've met, uh, oh, Don and I have just a few days ago with HDR, who is doing the cost of service study. Uh, we'd anticipate bringing something to you. Uh, don't know yet what, what type of format, whether it be another study session or just regular council, but uh, uh, where they can articulate what they have learned. Um, they've identified the costs uh, that we incur for treating each type of parameter that the program will regulate. And so they'll be able to share that with you here in a, a couple of weeks. Um, and we can go from there. So. Um, they will also give us, one of their deliverables is a tool that we can use for uh, helping existing and new industries decide whether they want to locate here, because we can tell them, you know, with a couple strokes of the keypad, uh, what it's going to cost them to treat their waste uh, under our current scenario. So that'll be a, a spreadsheet that'll be designed for... Well, right. I'm sorry? And that implement, or depend on what they implement at site as well, I suppose. If the industry or- Right, it, it it'll drive their decisions whether they need to pre-treat or yeah. whether they send to us, it'll help them make a business decision. So. This next slide, I think you guys have seen before, it's just a reminder of what typical domestic wastewater is um, compared to high strength domestic, compared to what Sioux City frequently treats. So I think it's just a slide to demonstrate that blue line, the blue bar all the way to the right for BOD, TSS, and TKN shows you that Sioux City has significantly higher strength wastewater than most municipal wastewater treatment plants. So that's the, the only point of that slide. Um, I, there's some data review and I, I'm gonna go through a few of these and if you want more, I've got even more after this. I don't know how, how data hungry you guys are. Um, this first slide um, starts, I don't know, can I point with the mouse? No? Um, the first slide, if you look at the bottom of the graph, um, it starts in January of 2016, and I've updated it as far as I can. Um, I can't remember, I think it goes through the middle of April. Um, the green lines are the allowable flow, um, what the plant is designed for hydraulically. The light white line that goes up and down in the back, those are daily flow readings, so you can see the fluctuation that um, the plant sees day to day. The blue line um, that looks like stairs, <coughs> That's the 30 day average for the flow. So you can see how month to month it changes. Um, I'd say, I'd point out, especially all the way to the right, you can see the elevated flow that the city's seen after the, the big rains and the flood events. So I think uh, they're still trying to figure out what's going on with that, the increased flow and increased loadings. <coughs> Um, this next graph is the same format, except it's for BOD. So this is on a pounds per day basis. The plant's designed to treat so much BOD per day. The green line is 80% of what they're allowed to treat. That 80% kind of uh, being the guideline that EPA recommends for when you need local limits um, or when you might wanna be thinking about plant expansion. So this just shows you that um, since 2016, there's been some fluctuations up and down um, above that 80% line. Um, BOD, the city, is think of it as food for the wastewater treatment plant and also the energy for the renewable fuels. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, it's a resource, it's energy, but it has to be treated with oxygen. And so your, right now your allowable head works load is based on what the plant's designed to treat. Same graph for TSS. Um, 2016, we were hovering right around the 80% mark, um, but you can see what was going on in 2018, that February and July timeframe, where we were up close to 200%, so times two what your plant was designed to handle. So that's TSS, is total suspended solids. Um, again, those definitions are on your handout. And TKN kind of being the most significant. You can see how historically, back in 2016, the city was well below the TKN design capacity. Um, TKN is pretty hard for the wastewater treatment plant to treat. It takes a lot of energy, a lot of money to treat TKN. And you can see that since 2016, it's been um, pretty much a gradual increase on the loading of TKN. Where's that coming from? Um, TKN, um, I mention it on here, but it's in protein. Um, animal processors use it a lot. 
Um, so a lot of industries in Sioux City generate TKN, and there have been a few big industries with a lot of flow that have significant amounts of TKN. Your plant, and it's not, there's not as high a capacity. Your BOD, you can treat, say, 89,000 pounds of BOD. Your TKN capacity is only 12,000 and change pounds of TKN. So you have a much lower number that you're starting with for a TKN. So then I just want to touch a little bit. So the next step, um, that 80% is what your treatment plant is allowed to design. Your code implements or recommends implementing um, allowable industrial loadings. So again, that's what you get when you subtract out the residential portion of your sewer service area. So I just have a few graphs of some of the preliminary calculations that I've done. Um, well, the first one is showing what we could do with um, a plant expansion or with some of the CIP projects that the city's planning, um, how we can increase the current Headworks design capacity to get a little bit more wiggle room there. So this is just one consideration that the CIPs that are, these are currently in place, correct? Um, that once these design improvements have been implemented, then the city should be able to re-rate their plant um, or approve an expansion where the state would recognize the additional capacity. Um, and these are real numbers where right now, I think from a solids perspective especially, it's hard for the city to say that there's more capacity there than there really is. There are some needed um, design improvements to the digesters, and Jeremy can talk more about that if you guys are, are interested, but there really do need to be some CIP projects before we can say you have actual um, additional capacity available. Where's our capacity at right now? Like for, for flow or for pollutant loading? Well, for both. Well, so these graphs um, show it on there. Um, so currently, you're basically look, looking at 18% additional capacity with the expansion, with the improvements that are in place right now. So we really don't have much left for capacity then. Say that again, Rhonda. So we really don't have much capacity left. No, so I mean, the take home message is that, um, I think I have it in there. Right now, when I do these allocations for Sioux City and the sister cities and the industries in all the area, we're pretty tight. We can make it work right now, but there's not a lot of room for growth. And TKN is still gonna be a challenge. So that's kind of the take home messages. So this is the same thing on the, um, on the design flow. Showing, um, I'm comparing dry weather and average wet weather. The numbers are a little bit different. Um, I'm actually allocating based on the average wet weather, which gives you a little more hydraulic capacity, but it doesn't change the pounds per day of BOD or TSS or TKN that you can allocate. So people just get that relative percent, smaller fraction of the pie, basically. Um, so just to highlight some considerations for your wastewater treatment plant, uh, for why there's some fluctuation and variation. Um, one is we have to keep in mind there's a nutrient reduction strategy that the city is gonna be um, required to implement um, eventually that's gonna require that they show reduced nutrient um, loadings and or discharges into the receiving stream. Um, when the city gets a new permit in March of 2020, the ammonia limits are supposed to be cut in half. So that's a variable that needs to be considered in the future. Um, hauled wastewater, especially with the renewable fuels project, right now um, there's not a significant amount of hauled wastewater. I don't have that in the calculations, but if that increases, um, then we need to make sure we include that in the calculations. Uh, the city, I understand, got approval to do a Anamox pilot project, and that could impact the um, design capacity, especially for the TKN that we're so concerned about. Um, the expansion rating that I mentioned, and then also surcharges. Uh, we discussed earlier implementing a new TKN surcharge. If that goes into place, then how much of an incentive will that be for industries um, to reduce their TKN loading? And what else can the city do to help um, incentivize reduced loadings of TKN? So some other variables um, for why this is such a dynamic process are just the South Sioux contributions. Um, Jolita um, is, a, is not a constant discharger. They only periodically discharge, but when they do, they discharge a significant pounds per day. So I have to include them in the allocation. And we actually met with them um, informally this morning just with Jolita, um, several other industries individually as well, but they were receptive um, and definitely willing to work with us. Right now, their agreement specifies a certain flow, only MGD. It doesn't specify pollutant loading. But looking at that TKN that they send, they were willing to 
cut back on that average daily flow so that he could cut back on the pounds per day of TKN that they discharge. And so there's higher with them. It's it's or can <laughs> TKN. Right? Yeah, they when they discharge, it can be about 25% of your allowable loading for TKN. So we have to include that in the calculations. And actually, and they, they have their own permit from the state to discharge. And that permit from the state requires they, that they look at nutrient reductions. So they sound like they're being pretty progressive. They've got a lot of other plants um, internationally where they have done nutrient reduction. So they said in the next five years, they'd like to not need to discharge to Sioux City anyway. So there's a dynamic there that um, seems like it could be beneficial to the city to, to continue that conversation. Um, the sister city agreements are critical, and then uh, just not knowing what type of growth everybody wants, not just Sioux City, but also the sister cities are other factors to keep in mind. So I got a question. So yes, what, what if they discharge more than what the capacity is on that day? Did, how does that work? Well, so um, we, in, in this draft allocation policy, I kind of talk about it. Number one, they wouldn't be permitted unless it was more than 5% of the allowable industrial load. So TKN being the main concern there. And um, if you have one violation, it's not usually significant. It's just if it becomes chronic, then they would be required to implement pretreatment. And really with their state operating permit and the requirement to evaluate that, they're already in the process of doing that. So we could collaborate um, with that same objective that they have from the state to help reduce those loadings. But uh, that's the difference between a permit limit and a surcharge. The surcharge is just paying for the additional cost. A permit limit, we'd say, no, it's a violation. And if it becomes chronic or significant, then you escalate that enforcement action. Does that make sense? Um, it, yeah, it does. But I guess my other question is that if they don't send out flow often, but when they do, it's over capacity, would that be considered a, a violation? Yeah, that it is. So uh, compliance is evaluated in a six month period. So if they only have one sample and that one sample is out of compliance, it's 100% of your samples out of compliance. So you've got to make sure that you're sampling frequently enough that you get a representative number. So if it's periodic, if they're only discharging a week, they might want to sample every day so they can show that their average is what it needs to be. Because if they only collect one sample, then that's 100% out of compliance and that's significant non-compliance, which is a big deal. Um, so next steps are actually coming up with the math to allocate to sister cities. Um, again, I'd refer you to that last page. I'm trying to come up um, in collaboration with the team here, come up with an approach that's um, fair. All the numbers are based on math. Um, and right now those are based on actual flows, not necessarily what are in the current sister city agreements. So, um, the process is complicated and it's gonna take some discussion that we can't get into today, but we can continue the conversation later if you guys wanna know more. Um, just if a industry is over, especially if they're over on something like BOD where the city has capacity, how can we make that okay? How can we offer a trading program um, or some type of offset where they would be allowed to discharge without implementing pretreatment if it's not really needed for the city's plant? So there's still some details there that we need to work out. Um, and I'm trying to make the math work for the sister cities and for the industries and for the industries inside that sister city. So it's a, it's a complicated problem, um, but I think we're pretty close to being able to at least take care of people's current needs. Um, but the important part being that when we talk about these sister city agreements, understanding what that future growth is um, for Sioux City and for the sister cities and how much additional capacity we wanna reserve. Um, keep in mind the surcharge modifications. When we did meet with the industries this morning, um, they were very interested in the timing and the magnitude of that surcharge. Do you want to touch on that, Mark? Or uh, I think we're getting just about out of time. Yeah, I think we're about done. Uh, That's it. We, we'd intend to bring uh, the changes to city code before you probably in June uh, for that uh, potential adoption. So it'll kind of give you an idea of what our next steps are. And certainly if you have questions, we're available to answer those, so. <coughs> Will the sister cities have a, an opportunity to review, or whoever else is interested in the industries, to review the, the changes coming prior to coming to council? They have seen it many times. Oh, they have, okay. Yes, we've met with them individually as well as group and. Yeah. But they haven't seen the final calculations. You're right? talking about the, the actual allocations. The allocation. allocations or something still need to be developed. Yeah. And I, we I need my question then is really backing on what Pete is saying. So then once we calculate 
and and you you input right. the formula to say we believe these will be the allocations. At that point, in time, my question is. Will you then come to us first and say this is what we determined, or will you go to the sister city what, and what we would industries? What we would propose to do is develop a draft allocation policy and ask you to adopt that policy so that gives us a basis then to discuss with them discuss. And, and others what that would look like for them. Is that challenging that if we do adopt that and implement, if we believe that that's the best way moving forward, and then they all come back and say, no, we don't believe that that's going to work for us? I mean, is that going to put us in a bind, or what are your thoughts if that would happen? We want to make sure it's going to work for the industries. That's why we're starting to talk to the industries yeah. to see where there is flexibility. Yep. So I, that's I, why I think I guess we'll I'm be able to. to ask, you know, who yeah. are you going to first, and does it make more sense to go to the industries and the sister cities and say, this is what we're calculating, this is where we believe it's at? Is that going to be acceptable? Is that something that you think would be advantageous for both well, we parties? Well, we do have a meeting with the MIUs tomorrow, <laughs> uh, mid morning that we're going to go over the same thing that we just did with you. And well, and it sounds uh, like it's going to be a little while before you nail down the calculations. I mean, I, I can understand it's probably a pretty complicated web of but, navigating that. I just 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 know, Mark and, uh, and Kim, mm -hmm. that I think that that would be my concern is just whether you come to us first or them first and how you navigate that to making sure they're on board and we're yep. on board. and. It's like a tennis ball, yep. Exactly. And, and so really we are gonna plan to do a very similar talk with the task force meeting tomorrow to keep everybody in the same loop. Um, yeah, and, which I think will be good, but they won't have numbers or allocation is what I'm getting. Um, Once you have that, then they're gonna be able to see how it will impact their budget. When, if we implement yep. it and say, well, this is what we're going for, and then it doesn't work for their budget, I mean, then we're kind of back. We are that starting. Sense. Am I following that right or no? Yeah, and we're starting with some draft numbers that okay. they can use as a guideline. Okay. And we want to make sure everybody's, uh, that the, we're trying to make it doable for everybody as best yep. we can. I understand. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> we adjourned the close or the um, pre-council pre study session. Second. Apron? Aye. Brecken? Aye. Moore? Aye. Scott Aye. Waters. Aye. Four o'clock by my clock, so you want to call the roll for the meeting, please? Gretchen? Here. Moore? Here. Scott? Here. Waters? Here. Capron? Here. Could we stand for a moment of silent prayer followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Today, so Mr. Moore is going to read the proclamations for me. Can we do those before we do the interview? And that's the way we got them is next.
foster care, as well as the dedicated and valuable contributions of foster parents. Now, therefore, Robert E. Scott, Mayor of the City of Sioux City, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council, does hereby proclaim May 2019 as Foster Care Month. <coughs> Um, thank you so much for um, the proclamation. We do appreciate um, everything. Thank you. Uh, sure, I'll say a few words. First of all, I'd like to f uh, thank the council for their support of our commission. And uh, we're doing our best to preserve uh, the history of Sioux City. Uh, we do have uh, three vacancies coming up uh, in June. So if you or know, know of anybody that's interested in serving in this capacity, we'd appreciate uh, directing them to the city uh, clerk's office. Uh, I might just give you a brief rundown on the week. Uh, we started out Saturday with the uh, Barstool Open, which we uh, uh, share with uh, Rivercade people. Uh, today's the proclamation. Uh, tomorrow night at six o'clock, we'll be gathering at Hunt School, uh, because Hunt uh, won't exist here shortly, and we're gonna take a tour of the neighborhood. And there, there's some rather famous uh, Sioux Cityans that went to Hunt and live in that neighborhood. Uh, Wednesday is the night off, and Thursday, help me, Aaron. Thursday night? Morningside. Yes, Morningside celebrating their 125th anniversary. So there'll be a walking tour of the Morningside area. And then Friday, we have the, uh, we're going to be awarding the Treasure of Sioux City Award. This uh, year, it's going to Arch Development that just finished uh, uh, renovating the uh, Central Annex. And if you haven't seen that, that is a marvel, what they did with that uh, facility up there. And then Saturday ends the week uh, with the uh, festivi festivities out there at the Rail Railroad Museum. So we thank your support for your support and also for Aaron's help with our commission. Appreciate it. Thank you.
Just thank you for your support, and uh, we'll continue on. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, <laughs> Paul um, Taylor the second. Are you here for an interview? Paul Taylor. Okay, we'll move on to the consent agenda today, which is items three through eighteen. E. You can consider every item to pass unanimously unless a separate roll call votes asked for by a council member. If you want to speak on an item, please come up as I read it. State your name and address for the record. If you want to speak on an item not on the agenda, please come up under citizen concerns. Again, state your name and address for the record. I'll move the consent agenda. Second. Three is the reading of the city council minutes of April 22nd, 24, 2019. Or is a resolution rejecting bids received for the Glen Avenue reconstruction project? Mayor, I'd like to pull that item for a separate vote. Is uh, Dave here? Hi, Gordon. No, he's not, but Gordon is. I, um, I've read through your memorandum, and I, and I appreciate the good work you've done. Um, <clears throat> it's not real clear to me why we would be rejecting all of the bids, we had two responsible companies um, bid on the project. They're within, what, within $20,000 of each other, or something like that. They're very close in the bids. Um, I'd be in favor of going with the lowest bidder and, and proceeding with the project. Just to be very candid up front with you. No reflection on what you're recommending and, and what you've done, but it, it just seems like we're ready to go. The contractors put together their bed packages. It takes a lot of work and effort, as you know, because you work on similar things. Mm -hmm. And um, the other concern I have, or that I would just point out, is the engineer's estimate is just that. It's an estimate. It's the best we can do at the time with the information we have, but we, we even have items later on in the agenda, Gordon, that where the estimate was either higher than what the bids were or they were way lower than what the bids were. So that's why I, I'm in a favor that we proceed with the lowest bidder and proceed with the project. Council Member Moore, I think the reason for the rejection is uh, there's not <coughs> adequate funding that's been identified for the project. That is, that is correct. It's strictly a funding? Yes. So the state would make us pay more than our percentage. They they have a base bid that they're going to fund at eighty percent. They, they do have a maximum, yes, up to their maximum of their bid. Right, and then the maximum would come uh, beyond that would come out of our. And we don't know what their bid was because well, they won't expose that. Right. Funny that the city has to expose their number for these bids, but the state doesn't. That's amazing how that works, but. The concern. So you're saying put it all into 20. In the 2020. year 2020, that way we can do it over one construction season. We can budget for it, <laughs> and we can also look at it at the project as a whole to see if we maybe we could uh, reduce the cost on some of this by possibly eliminating some, uh, one of the phases. Because when you have <laughs> multiple phases in these projects, it does cost the con the contractors charge more for that and rightfully so, because they have to incorporate that into their construction. So hopefully when we look at this, take a, a fresh look at it and rebid it in the fall, this, this early winter, um, in addition to hopefully some lower prices on materials because we do have some <coughs> problems with gravel at this point or um, from LG Everest. But it could go the other way, Gordon. I mean, it, yes, construction it could. costs have continually increased that each is year, and each year possible. we say, as a council, we say, wish, wish we would have done that last year or two years ago or, or three years ago. I look at it. We have we're bidding this in the middle of the year, with contractors that are already have their schedules built up, or filled up. I'm sorry, filled up, and with the cost, the extra costs and materials, to potentially. Reduce it with some value engineering, such as removing a phase, maybe a few other design changes that we could look at to help reduce these costs. And then maybe with the I-29 project finishing up this year, that'll help reduce some of these costs also. 
That's what we're gambling on. We had the bids come in at where the engineer thought they should be, the company that we used for the estimate. Then we had funding for that. Is that what you're telling me? Yes. Yes. And that's, Dan, that's the first thing that got my attention was the engineer's estimate was 20, over 27% higher than what, uh, or the bid was over 27% higher than what the engineer's estimate was. And, and I know an engineer's estimate is just that, an estimate, but I would venture guess that there haven't been many times we agreed with uh, an estimate that high, and it, it's about $640,000 more. Well, and the, <laughs> we don't learn around here. This should have been at the last, it should have been in the February bid letting rather than in a May bid letting. <laughs> You know, I don't know why we can't learn that. These projects are big enough that, that you've got to get them when a contractor doesn't have a full program. Yes. And that, that we are working on those procedures where we are going to design these projects two years in advance so that we can obtain all of our right-of-way access for these projects so we are not running into this problem bidding them out in the middle of the summer. Which is what we saw more of. And I think we saw, I mean, that's what happened with the resurfacing. I mean, I think the bids came in lower, or, you know, were advantageous to us with the resurfacing because of when we were able to put those bids out. So that, I, I that helped that tremendously. I, I agree that I'm hopeful we'll be able to continue to do that. And I'm, I'm glad that you're looking into a more <coughs> structured planning it further out so that we can really make sure that it's at the best time for us. Plus, well, there is the funding issue where... Yes. We, the extra money that is needed, if it does come in next year at the same price, for instance, then we can budget for it. Well, it seems to me that if we wait till the interstate's done, we're talking the end of two, 2019 here. Yes. Um, you're going to get contractors that are looking for work and that, that would bid it lower. It's not the same contractors necessarily, though. Big that's enough a, job. Yeah, that's a problem. And, and it's well, the I, unknown. Well, I appreciate what Council Member Gretkin has said. I, you know, I don't want to get into the details, but I wish I had an idea of why, did, why is it that much higher than? Why are the bids? Two great companies bid on this, Pete, and th there's a reason why they're far, that far off the mark then if it's 27%. I don't understand why they are. I wish, we, I, wish I could understand. Yeah, and that is something we want to look into also with, along with the value engineering. We want to, that's part of the value engineering, is to look into why these costs are so much higher. So do we have to start all over again? Not really, no. So we're under the engineer's contract right now? That contract continues? I mean, won't we have to bid? Uh, it, When we do some value engineer, yes, we may have to pay the engineer some, some added fees, yeah. So does that come back to its form of a, an amendment to the contract then? The consultant, yeah the design engineer. It may, and I'm not saying that's 100%. And in the history of the city, we never have had a situation like this? No, Bob. we've rebid contracts before. Yeah. We would? We've rebid them before. No, no, I mean where we proceed with the project, even when it's, so, so we don't have the funds, the funds aren't budgeted, that's the bottom line, that's what you're telling me. We, we've, we've awarded contracts that were over the engineer's estimate and above budget, but at this point we haven't identified where that, we're talking what, about $600,000? $600, that's substantially 000. over budget for, the, for a $2 million project, so we would have to take it from somewhere else and not do something else to be able to do this. So is the engineer giving you an explanation why was that far off? No, not at this moment. I'm repeating myself, but you go back to two companies, two contractors that they're within just hundreds. They're both loaded with work, though, Dan. One's got Riverside, yeah. one's got your school at Hunt. That's, here's, so that's gonna, that in and of itself is going to raise the prices. I'm not saying that they're not good contractors. It's just if you would have bid this, when you bid them, you might have had a fighting chance, but now... They're, they're loaded with work. Okay. And so they bid damages into this bad boy because you had a ton of them, I guarantee it, because they know they're not going to get it done. Well, it wasn't supposed to be finished this calendar year anyway. I don't care. They're still it not going to be two get different it. years. Probably no way they can get it done, I'm guessing, even with what, what date you got. Yeah. 
I wish it would go the other way, but if you're telling me we didn't budget for it and the funds aren't there, I don't know. <laughs> then I've got to come up with an alternative of how do, we, how do we fund it. I'm just worried that next year it might not be any better, except, Gordon, to your point, you said we'll have it. We might have to budget the $3 million, whatever. Well, if we bid it in October, I'm sorry, December, we'll have results back fair early enough so that we can work it into the budget process at that point. And, and you know what, if you only do it one phase, then that should make it cheaper too, shouldn't it? No. It, yeah, we're looking at doing it that too. Yes. Oh, because he knows he's got a full year's worth of work rather than a half a year's worth of work. He doesn't care if he has two years to do it. He bids that in. It's not going to make it yeah, cheaper. Yeah, but we do, and we should put it in the contract. Well, I'm just saying it's not going to make any difference on that. Whether you, if you bid more, if you bid a bigger job, you normally get lower quantity prices is how it works normally. But something in the project itself will have to change significantly. Have a bidding bid date that late will change it dramatically. I won't it say will. it will change. I'm sorry. A bid date bidding it that late for a project of this scope will change it dramatically. I'm not saying it'll change it 27 percent, but it'll change it dramatically because he's he's got four million up there and the other guy's got three million out in Riverside, right? I mean, seven, huh? Seven, seven million. Okay. I mean, that's a lot of work for our local contractors and the guys that don't have work didn't bid it. So what does that tell you? Okay. They didn't like the plan. So nobody liked the plans, obviously. So. I just wish I knew why we were, why the bids were that much higher, but. And that's something we're going to look into. Okay. And we'll, so eventually we'll find <coughs> out. Yes. Thank you. Type is a resolution authorizing request for release of funds. Oh, I'll, did you want to vote? I'll, I'll pull, I'll just pull the motion. So, and Mayor, if you can pull your mic down a little bit, they're just having a hard time hearing you. Well, I'm not talking very Everybody loud. Everybody needs to speak up just a little bit more and into the microphones. I'm sorry, I'm just not I know feeling there sick. today. No, I understand. <laughs> Resolution authorizing request for release of funds and environmental review for the lead-based paint hazard reduction program. Six is a resolution approving the annual action plan for CDBG Home Investment Partnership and the Emergency Solutions Grant Programs. Seven, a resolution is temporarily closing various streets in Morningside area on May 16th for the Morningside Days Parade. Eight is a resolution to adopt the plans and specs for the Division Street Paving Project. Nine, a resolution is amending the position classification manual by approving an updated job description for maintenance electricians. Ten, a resolution is approving payment to Nice from Electric for repairs on the 2900 block of Hamilton Boulevard. 11 is a resolution scheduling a hearing on amendment number one to the amendment amended and restated Donner Park Urban Renewal Plan, property at 4501 Southern Hills Drive. 12 is a motion appointing Dakota Kinney to the Historic Preservation Commission. The term expires June 30th, 2021. 13 are civil penalties and suspensions. A is a resolution scheduling a hearing on a $300 civil penalty against Transit General Store, 2324 Transit Avenue for violation of the cigarette laws. B is a resolution scheduling a hearing of, on a $300 civil penalty against Tobacco Hut, 4523 Morningside Avenue, violation of the cigarette laws. C is the resolution scheduling a hearing on a $1,500 civil penalty for a or 30 day permit suspension issued to Apparatus Aguera, 1010 Court Street for violation of the cigarette laws. To get, I didn't read this close enough and I apologize for that. To get a $1,500, how many times have you been banged to get there? I believe they've had two violations since the first of the year. Two, this whole? I thought it was three. Yeah, I think this it's- This one, um, it's the second violation within a two year period. Sometimes we shouldn't allow people to sell cigarettes if they can't be any more responsible than that. No, and here, here's the other side of it. I, when I had my business, I didn't sell cigarettes because first of all, you're not making any money. Second of all, they're coming in trying to, trying to get you, you know, to sell to a minor. I mean, it, it, it's a setup and that's 1,500 bucks is a big deal. 
The first violation was on January 11th, 2019. The second was on March 29th, 2019. Does a third violation in a two year period result in uh, revocation of their? I believe on a tobacco, it's a fourth. Fourth? Four before you get to the revocation. This is two. Liquor is three. Two months, three months. Lose your license for 30 days. I'm sure if he doesn't clean up his act, we'll hear from him again. 14 are actions relating to agreements and contract. They is a resolution awarding a service provider agreement to crystallization systems for storage system relocation at the Art Center. D is a resolution approving a fiscal management service agreement with Iowa's West Coast Initiative. I See, I wanted to chat about that a little bit if we could, Renee. <coughs> and I apologize, I should have given you a call earlier today. I just didn't have a chance since I was just getting back into the office. What I wanted to know was, um, I understand the new financial structure and things like that. The questions I have are regarding to when we are investing or really working with entrepreneurs on these different types of projects and whether it's in coordination with innovation market or otherwise, my question is, do we track some of their success stories? Do we ever do any of that of where we've really worked with them? It, like for instance, with this, because I think we need to start having marketing materials kind of talking about that. Sure. I think we do and I don't know, so that's why I'm asking. Renee Billings, Business Development Coordinator. Um, we do, we've actually started kind of a new thing with Siouxland Magazine. We're featuring a new entrepreneur kind of that has gone through and utilize our resources and focusing on highlighting them and their business and what they've used and how it's helped them grow. Um, we do also have uh, through the UNI, the pro program we did through them, we did have to do annual reports showing kind of what businesses we helped, what resources they used, and if they created any jobs. So we do do some track that way as well. Okay, that's great. Perfect. And then the second question that I was gonna have is do we have any opportunities for almost mentorship uh, type of relationships or is it more help and maybe just talk me through it is there more help on the front end or because sometimes I've talked to entrepreneurs that really feel like they do get a lot of help on the front end but then they hit a kink and they or hit a roadblock and it's kind of difficult sure that's been an ongoing discussion as well trying to connect mentors to new startups um, we have talked about various ways to do that I've it's kind of been a more um, individualized so if I have a an entrepreneur or startup talk to me about what their needs are, I will personally connect them with a business owner or whatever resource that might need. We don't have a structured program that does connect them though. Okay. Does SCORE even exist anymore? Um, I would say they're trying to reignite SCORE, but typically we send people to the Small Business Development Center uh, to get started that way. I just, this is something I really, believe, I really believe in and I want to continue to invest in. I just want us to also look at ways that we can try to improve the program or what we can really do to make sure that it's meeting the needs of entrepreneurs because I think that's you know, small entrepreneurs, I mean, our small businesses and entrepreneurs that are doing those things, I think they really are revitalizing a lot of communities across the country. Absolutely. So anything, anything we can do to help with that, I hope we can continue to work together. Yes, absolutely. And you know, the other thing too is finding, finding a, 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 a <coughs> owner, maybe you can't match them up to what they wanna do, but you can match them up to their personalities and, and uh, they, they can give, give them an overview of what, what they went through with their, Absolutely. With their work. And actually through our, our um, business competitions, a lot of the judges we have are existing business owners or entrepreneurs themselves. And so they reach out to the participants in the business competition. So it's kind of a good way to connect with entrepreneurs that way. <coughs> Thanks. Okay. C is a resolution approving a First Amendment to the development of minimum assessment agreements with Kinsess Hospitality. D is a resolution approving a contract to Infrastract for the Riverside Storm Sewer Cleaning Project. They're still out there cleaning now, right? I mean, I found it humorous. You said you didn't know exactly what the price should be. My God, after what we've gone through out there, how do we not know the price? It's one of the largest change orders you've ever had, Mr. Yeah. Gordon. Yeah. I would Gordon think, I would think you that would give you a really good idea of how much that's going to cost to clean. That was a, um, th these are, those are two different projects. I understand that, but so. two different, not necessarily, but there, isn't it in basically the same pipe, just downstream? 
Uh, no, this is the this is a storm in Riverside. That one was a sanitary. Oh, this is storm sewer. Right. Okay. Well, it, it, it's still got to be about the same price to clean one or the other, isn't it? We should hope, but it we were off. I see, I seen them out there working today. Will they ever be done there? Or is that just like like a lifetime contract that they've happened to come upon in the city of Sioux City? They are making headway on that that project. <laughs> That is a utility project. I understand that, but uh, I got to believe you know a little bit about it, but okay. He is resolution approving a contract a municipal pipe tool for the annual utility lining project. F is resolution approving a contract to mark out Benicia's for the police parking lot reconstruction project. Did you ever give me an answer of why whoever engineered Douglas Street and Pearl Street didn't figure out they needed a bigger storm sewer in Pearl Street? For crying out loud, that wasn't done that long ago. No, it wasn't, and I did look that up, and I, I could not find an answer why it was only put in as a 36-inch uh, storm in Douglas, uh, not Douglas, 6. So now we run it all the way out front, rather than dumping it right there in the back. Unbelievable. G is a resolution approving a contract to Dactronics for the Tyson video and scoreboard system project. I had a question about that one. <laughs> Up, Alex. Um, I'm wondering, and maybe this is a question more for Dactronics, but I'm hoping that you have the answer. Some of the things in different venues that I've been a part of um, or been to events at, I really like some of the live action that they're able to do and have different things connect into it so they can shoot that and a little more high def. Is that going to be an opportunity for this video board? Do we? Um, Rick Fouth, Director of Operations, Tyson Event Center. Uh, what, are you, what are you kind of talking about? So we are going to looking at HD cameras to be compatible with the HD scoreboard. What do you mean live action? Because, well, and we've been able to do more immediate, like, replay stuff, I mean, with NAI and stuff like that. I just want to make sure that it, we're improving our capabilities when we're looking at that, you know, going to some of the different basketball tournaments and stuff. I've seen more live action with yep. video cameras in the Alex, in the fan area. My understanding, we're buying a state-of-the-art system. Yeah, yeah but I, that doesn't necessarily answer the question, who's buying the HD cameras? These guys or the guy that does the video now? Uh, as far as I know, Kevin is. He is buying video. Or he's at least looking into it. He, that's what we had, the conversation me and him had. Uh, but to go back to what, what you were guys just talking about, uh, we are looking at like a tablet system uh, so we can have communication everywhere. Uh, so if we want to do on field <laughs> stuff, you know, we don't have to always have somebody in the sound room. We're going to have a, the scoreboard's going to be on a tablet. So it's going to be instant, hopefully instant. Yeah. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. Yeah. Um, but those conversations are being had currently with Kevin and different capabilities that we can look to improve. So you're wiring, because this doesn't the wire to the camera have to be different than the, just the camera itself? Uh, that, I don't know, like I said, we're, me and Kevin are still in communication to try to fix this all up. Uh, he was at the pre-bid meeting, uh, which a lot of questions were asked then. He was finding uh, answers out, uh, but he all, is also gonna be at the pre-construction meeting uh, to kind of get all this hashed out and figure out what we need to be done. Fifteen purchasing A is the resolution awarding a purchase order. The integration partners for extreme network sw switches. B is the resolution awarding a purchase order to cap recycling for clean asphalt millings, crushed concrete, and crushed asphalt. C is the resolution awarding purchase orders to Boundary Medical for equipment pharmaceuticals for the EMS division. Sixteen are applications for cigarette tobacco nicotine. Paper permit. See the list. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Seventeen are applications for beer and liquor license. See the list. Do you have any questions? Come forward. Eighteen are receipt of minutes. See the list. Come forward if you have questions. Anyone to be heard on any of those items? None will vote. Nicole, would you mark on the uh, applications for the at sixteen and seventeen the hard rock that I'm abstaining? Yes. Please.
You don't need the numbers or anything, do you? I believe it's 16 <coughs> A19. Right. Everybody voted aye. We'll go to recommendations of P&T. Hearing an ordinance vacating part of West 20th Street Petitioners, Donald Gooston, p and recommends approval. I'll move that. Second. The hearing is now open. Would anyone like to speak? Michelle Fertz, give us your findings, if you would. Yep, Michelle Bostonellis, uh, Chair Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, this item on uh, West 20th Street, uh, adjacent to uh, Ruby Street, the vacation, uh, was uh, recommended for approval by the Planning and Zoning. Um, there was one neighbor who came who had some concerns about the culvert in the area, making sure that that was cleared, um, and the, uh, the applicant and the, and, and the neighbor did talk about it during the meeting, but otherwise the, um, the Planning and Zoning did make a recommendation to approve. Anyone else to be heard? The hearing's now closed. Passes five zero. Is anyone opposed to waiving the statutory rule? No. no. I'll move that. Second. Capron? Aye. Brickin? Aye. Moore? Aye. Scott? Aye. Waters. Aye. I'll move third reading, or second, second and third. Second. Passes 5 0. 20 is a hearing and ordinance vacating part of Peters Avenue. The petitioner is Richard Marla. PNZ recommends approval. I'll move it. <coughs> Second. Hearing's now open. Like to anyone like to speak, please come forward to the microphone. Go ahead. Um, the planning and zoning did uh, also recommend approval of this item. There was one neighbor who came who was in favor of it. Michelle, in your or in the minutes, I would yeah. some of the recommendations. You right. had a concern about the washout um, well, of the sidewalk there. I think. Yeah. Do you know if they looked into that at all, staff? I, I hadn't heard if staff looked into it. I don't know. Yeah, the, the neighbor did have one. That was kind of the one concern of, of why, you know, she was in favor of it and concerned about the, the sidewalk washing out. I thought, well, maybe we need to go out, you know, have someone go out there and just see what's going on and what's causing, causing the washout. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, yes, staff did. Yeah, go ahead. Staff did go out and take a look at the sidewalk, city engineering uh, staff, and they did send a letter of abatement um, to the adjacent property owner to take care of some of the debris on the sidewalk and address the washout. For the recording, will you state your name? And oh, I'm sorry, Aaron okay. Berzina, Planning Department. Thank you. Thank you. Thank God we have you two ladies here to keep up. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, you've got to come forward, state your name and address. Richard Merla, 2422 Highway 20, Lawton, Iowa. Uh, I'm the petitioner to vacate the property there on Peters Avenue. Uh, since I started this project, I've discovered that the city had been dumping dirt and I've had many, many tons wash in that yard and ruin the building, diverted water into the basement of the house. So now we're in the process, we gotta do something about it. And I'd like to acquire Peters Avenue and so I can shape it, clean it up, and put it on the tax roll. I think you're going to get that done because nobody's here objecting. So I think you're. Yeah. It's going to happen here in just a minute. Thanks for being here. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate yeah, thank it. You. Uh, 
passes five zeros. Anybody opposed to waiving the statutory rule? No. I'll move that. Second. Gregan? Aye. Moore? Aye. Dot? Aye. Water? Aye. Capron? Aye. I'll move second, third. Second. This is five zero. Twenty one is a hearing and resolution or ordinance adopting a site plan for fourteen hundred West First Street. The petitioners USL your PNZ recommends approval. I'll move that. Second. Hearing's now open. Anyone can speak that wants to. Go ahead, Michelle. Michelle Bosnaz, um, Planning and Zoning Chair. Um, this recommendation was also from the Planning and Zoning to approve. Um, we did have a condition that the um, that the fences, the, um, the opaque fence, eight foot tall opaque fence around the tower. Otherwise, there weren't any comments on this item um, from any members of the public during the meeting. Anyone to be heard? Hello, uh, my name is Josh Watson. I'm here representing US Cellular on this matter. Um, and we appreciate planning and zoning's recommendation. Um, we have actually updated uh, the site plan, and, and I'm going to get over that over to uh, planning and zoning with their uh, the opaque fence that they requested. Thank you. I have to abstain on this item. Conflict of interest. Well, Passes four zero to one. <laughs> Mr. Moore abstains. Is there anybody opposed to waiving the statutory rule? No. I'll move that. Second. Moore? Abstain. Scott? Aye. Waters? Aye. Apron? Aye. Gherkin? Aye. I'll move second, third. Second. is four zero to one, Mr. Moore abstain. 22 is a hearing and ordinance adopting a site plan for 4200 Green <coughs> Avenue. The petitioners, U.S. Cellular, P&Z recommends approval. I'll move that. The hearing's now open. Would anyone like to speak <laughs> for or against the ordinance after Michelle gives us her vote? Yes, Michelle Boston Ellis, Planning and Zoning Chair. Um, this item, um, we did make a recommendation uh, to council for approval. Um, again, we had the same um, condition, I believe, yeah, we did have the same condition with the opaque fence around it. Um, there were several neighbors who um, did come to the meeting um, that were opposed to it. Um, comments that came up um, regarding the um, gravel road and the, and the access, um, maintaining that gravel road. Um, there was also comments just that there were a lot of towers in the area. Um, and again, the, the road kind of came up again, the condition of the road, those were the, the two things. And Michelle, it was my understanding in the minutes it was talking about that there is another tower with lease space available for that at that location. Is that accurate? There's a comms tower. Um, well, I believe and maybe staff can help me on this one. <laughs> I believe we're talking probably the the tower at the on the WIT campus. Correct. Chris Madgen, senior planner. There is a tower on the WIT campus uh, that is mostly used for emergency management, but there is lease space available on that. Uh, in the staff report, it does go through the different regulations that have been imposed on cities and what we can or cannot do. We can ask the petitioner if they looked at various different sites. We cannot require them to co-locate on an existing tower. Correct. So we can ask them if they've looked at putting it on that <coughs> tower, but we can't require them to do that. But we Correct. could also vote no, saying that we don't want the addition of a new tower in hopes that they would do that. Is that accurate or no? It's fuzzy. I don't like the terms of the city attorney's leases. Sorry. Just throwing that out there. I didn't hear what you said, I'm sorry. They don't like the terms of the city attorney's leases that she does on those. I'm not saying they're wrong because everybody else accepts it, but this group doesn't like your terms. 
our understanding of both federal and state law, essentially what's left to cities to review with cell towers is setback requirements and neighborhood character. Those are the only two items that we can review. Okay. But we could say due to neighborhood character, we are there are already towers in the area. We don't want an addition. And at this point, I'm not sure neighborhood character has been defined and what that is. So I'm stretching. Yeah. Anyone to be heard? Um, I'm Doug Hesse. I live at uh, 408 uh, Cleveland Street. Um, <clears throat> the property next door, the tower is going to be put. Um, it's right outside my my house, within 600 feet. There's within a half a mile. There's already two towers, the wit, and there's another one on Correctional Road, just to the west of me. Um, and also, <clears throat> the gravel road. There's uh, it's not maintained by the city. I've lived up there 21, 22 years. I've maintained the road to my house. The gravel is from the neighbors that live there. We maintain it, put the gravel on it. Um, it's, the city doesn't do anything for it. <clears throat> that's my concern. All the extra travel now, that's just more wear and tear on the road. I have to maintain. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. No problem. Just name your name and address. Uh, thank you. My name is Julie Shebeck, and uh, my address is 2124 Larry Drive, Northeast Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And I'm here on behalf of USCOC of Greater Iowa LLC. Um, the information that's presented for to you um, yes there are a couple towers in the vicinity and we have analyzed them okay uh, secondly there were neighbors last at the last meeting there were neighbors that had brought up the the topic about the gravel road and um, we have looked at the road it is something that we feel that we can use to access the tower site <coughs> the construction is usually six to eight weeks kind of weather permitting and it's done in stages and then there's an existing entrance and an, um, uh, kind of, if you will, the landowners have an existing access road on their property, so this was why we felt that we could use this. After construction, the site is considered unmanned, so that there's no like, traffic back and forth. The technician maybe shows up uh, once a quarter. So that is why we feel that we're not gonna be hindering um, the, the roads in, that, in the area that the gentleman and that, that was, ooh, excuse me, that was mentioned at the previous meeting. Okay, so, so my question is, being that you're gonna use that road for six weeks, back and forth, mm -hmm. are you gonna replace the gravel and all? Well, um, let me, I'll have my project manager because I'm, I do not have the finances to say that. <laughs> or the authority to say that. There you go, that's what we're talking about. Hi, uh, Daniel White, uh, 12020 Ridgemont Drive in Urbandale. I'm with US Cellular, I'm project manager with US Cellular. The, the right of way that we're coming off of, uh, Julie mentioned, which is the access to the uh, proposed tower space, is a city right of way, and that road is a city street. So. No, but we don't maintain gravel roads, so he's right, so I would hope you'd be a really good neighbor when you got done. I think we would, yeah, if, if we could work with city staff on that and see what that entails, that is something we could Well, it's gonna depend that. a lot, I'm sure, on the weather you encounter. If you don't encounter rain, it probably isn't gonna be a, Huge deal, but I would I would hope that you would come to town, and you're, you know you may get two or three of these approved today, and show that you are going to be a good neighbor because the little price of gravel if you buy it the city will spread it if I'm not mistaken is that correct? Yeah, the city will spread it for you if you buy it. So okay. So. so what, will that work for you then? Yeah, we'll work with city staff and, okay. and see what what needs to needs to happen in that regard. Okay, but but you're saying that you will do the gravel and we'll we'll all work together. I, I that's what I want to hear. Yeah, that's what I, I want to hear. I haven't seen the 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 road per se. I okay. mean, I I we can't commit to to rebuilding a, a gravel road. Well, I'm not saying rebuilding. Yeah. A, he, yeah. he, we're just talking gravel. Yeah, that's. You can't ask him to commit today either when he hasn't seen it. But yeah. I would hope they'd be. Good. Well, she saw it. Have you seen it? Uh, yes, I have. I've seen it. Yes, when you come across the bridge and then you come down on Cleveland Road, and I, I guess I should, should ask the gentleman if that's the particular section that he's um, referring to. 
Well, we're talking the road to the cell tower. So is that, was that the road you were talking about? The yeah. road to the cell tower? The, the road coming off Correctional Road, coming up to my place, turns from uh, Egbert up to, to Cleveland. Mm -hmm. From Hennepin to Cleveland to my house is not maintained. So they do about a block and a half of that gravel. From there on up, we maintain. But the piece that they're talking about is a lane going into where this tower site is. It's not a lane. The people that have bought that property have created, created their own road for a dump site in that area. That's what they're calling a road or a lane. It's basically nothing but an access to get where they've been going in and out of that field. That's all it is. There's no gravel up to that point. It ends at my driveway. Okay, so I'm not asking him to do anything more than what, what you're talking about, so. Right. Right, a lot. Yeah, just for clarification, along, I mean, to, to work with the city and the appropriate parties to for the, the gravel on that Cleveland Road stretch right. coming mm -hmm. into the landowner's property. Yes. What about the maintaining of the wear and tear after all this equipment's ran across it and tore it up? In all, in the well, we, well, okay. we don't know that's going to happen until we get the tower built either, so I, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that we work with them, but we can't, if it doesn't rain or anything, there's, uh, yeah, because you know, like right isn't. now when the frost goes out of the road, it takes me two to three weeks to get it back up to where it's past. I agree. Where it's good but but they're not going to be responsible for that after they get the tower up because it, you're like you, you just said you're going to check on it what once every three months yep. or something. Yeah. Right. So right. Yeah, I mean, and they right, they drive a normal SUV or a truck. Right. I mean, so you, you can't expect them after they get it done, fix the road, everything should be fine. So we can ask the city for help on this after this, per se, then? Right. Well, okay. we'll take care, of, they'll take care of the gravel and we'll take care of spreading it. My name's Pam Hesse. I live at 408 South Cleveland. I see one tower out my back door. I see one tower out my front door. If these guys go, then I'll have another tower. You know, it's like, if you look at the way that you guys have the roads, the only roads that are mapped out are for our four little houses when you come in off of Lakeport to Egbert to Cleveland. There are no roads. The people that bought the land that want the cell tower have not split their land up to put the other part of the road in. They have come up and started making their own road. If you look in the history, there's a fence that goes down there. Those two farmers never crossed over into each other's paths unless their cows did. And that's the only time. So it's like, you don't, I mean, the people that own that, their kids are up and down constantly. And like my husband says, they run businesses, okay. They take their tree cuttings, their grass cuttings, all back there. They were stacking it at the property across from us, but it got to smell so bad, we contacted the city to see what could be done there and that. Um, the only part that the city takes care of this road is when you come into Lakeport, there's a bridge. And if you look at that bridge, there's two bridges. There's a bridge on top of a bridge because at that time there was so many trucks coming in. But well, then you turn and you go on to Egbert. You go to Egbert to Hennepin, that's where the city turns around and goes back out. They don't come any further than that. The gravel is gone. There is no, nothing on the one side. You did definitely don't want to get close to the right side of the road. You will go to the creek, which is down quite a ways. So we try and keep it off to the one side. But people that don't know that, in front of our house, we need to put more gravel because the road the is literally sinking. The dirt is. It gets muddy. It's so soft, we can barely get to our driveway. And that's what we're, you know, we're the ones, all four of us houses, we pan together to take care of it because the city doesn't. We just want to minimize all of this. And I really don't want to look at another tower. I mean, two is more than enough. Sir or ma'am, my question about that was, <laughs> not you, sorry, um, was just as far as the other tower, if you had looked into that, is the mayor correct in the language? Yeah, the state statute's pretty clear that, you know, we we have to disclose that we have looked at other structures and 
felt that this is the best site for our network. Okay. Anyone else be heard? I'm curious why you have two people representing the same company. That's just out of curiosity. It just seems a little bizarre to me. But. <laughs> Um, actually, it happens all the time. Um, I do site acquisition work on behalf of them, so I am a contractor as well as uh, Josh Watson, who had spoke earlier. So a lot of the times we will do a lot of the legwork, the eyes and everything for the project manager who has got an extremely large load of work and so we kind of help him take off some of that work, so yes. Okay. Just was curious. The first <laughs> <laughs> oh, hearing is now closed. No, huh? no, no. Oh, now it is. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, hearing's now closed. Hang on a minute. I have to abstain on this one too. I, well, I know, I don't know how, I didn't vote aye, I know that. I have to abstain on 20. Push the abstain button, I believe it'll. Well, that's what I did on 21. I'm just saying, I'm not sure how it came up on 22. I need to abstain on <coughs> item 22 for conflict. Oh, that. You need to re vote it? You can still change it unless the votes are locked in. No. Okay, thank you. No, that's all right. I don't know how that. Yeah, something went crazy. I must have, you know, if I put my agenda over it, maybe. Are we all voting again? Yeah. Yes, please. There you go. Now Sorry. It's It passes uh, three to one, Mr. Moore abstains, and one negative, Mr. Waters, so I believe we can't do second and third. Got two, we need four votes. To okay, so it'll be back next week. Now we'll go to the hearing and ordinance adopting a site plan at 4901 Freelon Drive. Petitioner, U.S. Cellular, the PNC recommends approval. I'll move it. Second. Hearing's now open, Michelle. This is Michelle Bosnell, Care Planning and Zoning. Um, this item we also recommend uh, for approval. Um, the conditions we placed on it were also that the um, request the chain use fence um, around it be opaque, and then also requested that gravel drive be paved for the first 25 feet so the gravel doesn't pull down onto Freelon Drive. Uh, there was one uh, person who came to the um, public hearing at the Planning and Zoning Commission and just had some more questions than anything, wanted to make sure there weren't any lights or sounds that the tower would make and um, w was told that there, there wouldn't be. Anyone to be heard on this item? Josh is back. Yep, Josh is back. You figured out you had to show up this time, huh, Josh? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, just like before, you know, we've we've been working with planning and zoning on this, um, and did uh, change our drawings uh, to be in accordance with their conditions. Um, we've changed the the access to be paved for the first 25 feet. Um, th one thing that was brought up uh, at the planning and commission meeting was a curb cut. There's actually no curb out there um, to cut. Uh, <coughs> and then we did change our plans to have an opaque fence as well um, and, you know, answered the questions of the, the citizen that came out. Anyone else be heard or against? Hearing is closed. Passes is four zero to one. <laughs> Anybody opposed to waiving the statutory rule? No. I'll move that. Second. Scott? Aye. Waters? Aye. Capron? Aye. Gretkin? Aye. Moore? Motion in the, or I'll need, uh, move the second and third, I'm sorry. Second. 
Second. Passes is four zero to one. Hearing, hearing and resolution approving span, plans and specifications for the Tyson automation system upgrade. I'll move that. Second. Oh, the public hearing is now open. Would anybody like to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Can someone walk me through just a little bit of what all this entails, what all the automation system includes? Um, I was just wanting to walk through, I, I just didn't think it was very detailed as far as what it was specifically automating or what the system upgrades would be. I mean, I, I know that it includes the smoke control system. Can you just talk through what? Yeah, uh, Rick Powell, Director of Operations, Tyson Event Center. Uh, basically what this is, is it, we're upgrading the communication that we have with the equipment and our, basically our software and database. Uh, so right now we're getting uh, miscommunication, misreads, uh, modules are going bad, um, and we're finding out that the modules that we have there are getting older, harder to find, more expensive. So with this project, we're going to be upgrading the system, getting better transfer, uh, better communication between the equipment, uh, better readings, more accurate information, and uh, we're also going to be getting a, uh, a mobile, uh, so get like an iPad uh, with graphics on it that shows if there is something wrong with the equipment, what is specifically is wrong with it, which will be uh, save on expenses and time that we can pinpoint exactly what's wrong and then go to fix it. So it helps with troubleshooting as well. I like that you're including the building smoke uh, yes, control that, system. Yep, that's part of this project as well. Um, so <laughs> it's, gonna be a, it's gonna be a good project for the building. So I think I covered it. That's no fine, that helps me though, right? Okay. That's no key fob yet. That's it. Well, and that's where I was just, I was just trying to get a, a little bit of a clear picture about what it was. So I appreciated that answers. Yeah, yeah it's basically just the equipment. So yeah, cool, thanks. Anyone to be heard? Hearing is now closed. Passes 5025 is a hearing and resolution approving the proposal to sell part of the vacated Darling Avenue and authorizing a deed to petitioners Daryl and Karen Nee. I'll move that. Second. Public hearing is now open. Would anyone like to speak for or against the item? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Are you holding up? Passes five to zero. Excited to still be here. <laughs> Downtown Partners quarterly update. Thank you. Good afternoon, Reagan, the Executive Director of Downtown Partners. Uh, we're doing our quarterly update for you. I feel like we just saw you at a joint meeting, but uh, we have some projects that we'd like to update you on, and if you have any questions, please feel free to stop us in, in the meantime. Oh. 
Uh, currently, our board of directors, Jennifer Bass, is our president, uh, Julie with Soho Kitchen and Bar is our vice president, and Chris Jackson is our treasurer. We are at the point in the year where we also go and send out ballots uh, for new board members. We will lose Terry Glade and Ryan Avery this year on our board, so we will be looking to replace those members. Uh, board ballots go out to all of our membership uh, here in May, and then they have 30 days to respond, in which then the board uh, approves their nominations and for the ballot. Uh, next is just kind of a glance into financials. We are um, basically experiencing an over expense of income because we are spending down our reserve. So you will see where we have 105% spent that is expected. It's kind of normal what we were expecting this year to bring in some larger projects. Um, and then next year, just to show for FY20, we are looking at kind of a decrease in our income um, down to 323,000. So we are currently as a board looking at our projections for our budget and that will come out in June, but we are looking at some things that we are gonna have to kind of get slimmer on. So looking at that now. Uh, three areas and work groups that we involve the community pretty heavily in are the three work groups of community, economy, and environment. And I'll go through some of our projects because really that's how we kind of sort out our strategic plan. Economy, oh, sorry. Can I just ask a question? I'm sure. not moving very quick today. You said you're, you're going to have a less income. Be that has to be because the valuations of the buildings downtown went down? Correct. Correct. We saw a decrease in that, and also we had um, an issue with our income with the residential. Uh, so now the multi-use, those we're going to see a hit of about 20,000 just from that. So, thank you. Yep. <coughs> Uh, the first group I'll cover is economy. These are just our four kind of goal areas for the next year. Um, we have a software that we'll be updating, um, looking at some vacant and dilapidated buildings and how we can function with those. Overnight on-street parking in some of our entertainment areas, and then our storefront and startups grant program, this was the first year for that, did really well. We still have 2,500 left to use this year, but we have had some great use out of that, uh, one of which the first that was completed was the furniture store at 7th and Pearl. Um, they got a, their awning down, it was torn and, and ripped and looking pretty tattered. So we helped sh cost share with them to get that done. Brightside now has their sign up. Uh, Jackson Street Brewing has the garage door that they're gonna be opening up for summer patio <coughs> and some other areas like that. So it's going really well and our businesses are capitalizing on that. Um, what you have in front of you, the other piece to this group was to do an annual report. This is something we're gonna start doing yearly instead of every five years upon renewal so that we can start keeping some budget numbers and things like that on task and get these out to our property owners and they just went out in the mail. Um, what it shows you is basically some stats on shopping. We had 33 new businesses, living units, residential. We're gonna see an increase in those, so just, this just kind of helps us track where that's at. Also events, what we support, what we work with, and how we do. Um, 355 <coughs> supported events this year. It's been a busy year in downtown, and this summer looks to be no different. Um, environment is more of our greenscape and uh, parks and things like that. So how many planters we, we help water, uh, different trees, poles, what we put up for flags, and basically just putting numbers to some of the return on investment pieces that we do have. Um, the other piece to that is social impact. We saw a great increase this year with some of our social efforts. Um, you can see even the 175%, that's basically because we put in a solid effort to get out more messages. So that's what you'll see there. But again, these numbers and stats that can compare over years. What um, do you mean by messages spent? Sorry? What do you mean by messages spent or sent? Messages we put out. So Just what we put on out. Facebook though, like yeah, on posts. Facebook, Instagram, all of our I, social media posts. I was thinking they were you were meaning like private messages or no, that's more. You'll see that in the engagement. But it's just more like posts. Yep. More posts. Correct. That's why you saw such a big jump is because there was the effort. Um, environment is another work group that, again, works with a lot of the greenscaping. Uh, they'll develop and work with a bi-weekly litter plan. We've categorized downtown into different areas, usually about a block radius where we have a team captain on each block, and they're involved with the businesses that are on that block to help with bi-weekly cleanups. We provide, with the city's help, the bags and the gloves and things like that to pick up litter in their areas or just to pick up around them. Uh, we feel that sometimes it's just if you can get five feet in front of you, and if everybody does that, we're going to have a great, much easier time when it comes to the litter dash that we just had in April. So um, installing recycling units is something you also saw in the news lately um, with the 13 units that we're putting downtown to help in the recycling efforts. 
Also developing murals and art. Uh, we have Helan going out yet this summer for some of our street art projects and things like that. And then connecting two of our bigger projects are lighting and wayfinding. Um, with the art, I'll go back real quick. Uh, I got yeah. one question for you. <laughs> um, with all these recycling bins out there, who cleans them? Uh, Gil takes, I was gonna say, I don't know if Melissa is still here, but Gil takes the recycling as they do the garbage. In downtown, um, city staff goes around and they collect all the garbage onto trucks, and basically then they get put back into the dump. Same thing with recycling, it'll all get picked up at once and then go back through. So, so somebody will take it out of the recycling and, Correct. and have it sitting there for them. They're not going and taking it out themselves. What? No, 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 no. Yeah, somebody forgot. There are bins on the street. Yes. Yep. Okay, uh, the newest piece of artwork you'll see in downtown is actually in our skywalks. We have been working with West Middle School in their eighth grade program. Uh, the eighth graders all did one eight by eight piece and then they put it together and installed in one large piece. It's called Sugar High. And this year they're hoping that every year they'll do something different. Um, we've had some great success, very little vandalism in the skywalks and quite frankly, the more art you can get up there, the better. Um, that's just a blank canvas for most of them. So we're working on that to get more up there as well. Um, in June 2019, in a couple months here, we'll be seeing the festoon lights going up on historic 4th Street. Uh, the upper picture is a very, that was just me on Google Maps, so excuse, I didn't know rendering specialist <laughs> by any means. But to get, um, they are 20 foot poles on the corners that will hang festoon lights across the star, um, highlighting the star on historic 4th. Uh, the second part to this project, and I put an image up there of festoon lights just in case you didn't know what those were with the hanging lights. Um, doing that again on 4th and Pearl and then using 4th Street as more of a pedestrian walkway and working on the lighting to get people from both of our entertainment districts and then up to Pearl Street Park and then eventually phasing through to get them down to the riverfront. So using lighting as more of a corridor type action at night for people I, walking. I thought that you had talked about not doing it. <laughs> we can't hook it to the building. That's where we oh, started. That's okay. We started with hooking it back and forth over the street to the buildings and the structural engineers basically said that's a terrible idea. Oh, so, <laughs> so they're just going back and forth with the poles, is that the So we'll just do the corner poles and then we'll keep the um, globe lights that you see in the historic district. So we went through Historic Preservation Commission and looked at that with them as well, where these are being installed to make sure that the bricks are placed and things like that, so make sure it stays historic. Um, the other piece is wayfinding. We've been doing quite a bit lately with wayfinding, not only trying to get money for it, but also trying to cut some costs and see where we can work with this. Um, one of the things that we uh, have been looking at and I think is gonna cut quite a bit of cost, I hope, um, is using our electrical boxes on the corners. I put an image up here for you, and Rick is here with me as well. I'm from AJ Phillips, they're helping us with this, is basically taking the power boxes that already exist on the corners of downtown and using those as pedestrian wayfinding instead of installing a new pedestrian kiosk which in the pricing is a very expensive piece. Uh, this came from the Chambers Committee that mentioned that this might be a good area to look at cutting some costs. So we worked on that and it'll save a little bit in the long run. So this is something that we're looking into. And community, I'll let Kaylin cover I'll that take one. for community. Um, Kaylin, downtown partners. Um, so community, we kind of regrouped to figure out what we're really trying to push um, as individuals of this organization. And so we started with college engagement and college connections. The biggest thing is we want young professionals to stay in Sioux City and we have multiple colleges in the area and why are we not utilizing or capitalizing on them? Um, so with that, we're gonna start little packets of downtown VIP cards for students um, that are visiting as well as with your um, downtown VIP cards, students will also be able to use those discounts with their valid student ID. Um, at participating locations, those are all online. Um, and so with that is the VIP program kind of going hand in hand and figuring out ways to connect the community with downtown and figuring out different businesses and what they can be doing and seeing while they're here. Um, and then another key thing that they're working on is a welcoming committee and being the faces of downtown. So when a new business comes in, this group will go out and say hi and like let them know what Downtown Partners does because there is only a couple of us. So having those extra hands and faces to go in and kind of talk about what they need or if they are just saying hello or um, maybe giving some insight if they hear any feedback or concerns within the community. Um, and then the last one is our e-blast. So it's been looking the same for quite a while and so we're trying to figure out and revamp our website and our e-blast to make it more engaging with um, individuals that get it. So if you're just looking for dining and drink events throughout that week, you can just click on that and scroll through instead of having to look through the 25 and 30 plus. Um, but you can always look through all of them. 
So I, I have an idea for you. Yes. So okay, so you, you're the new businesses that that you get downtown, right? Mm -hmm. You talk about you guys going out and greeting them. Yes. Maybe you should get together with the people that are the business that are, that are already down there and <coughs> take somebody along with you, and so they can introduce their. Yeah. Stuff. That's what yes, and that's what our goal is to make everyone like being able to talk to your neighbors and understand or. But I'm I, but I'm saying bring your neighbor to to the new business. To the new business. Yeah. Okay. And Definitely. What what better way than to. You know, agree on success story yeah, already. Like my neighbor. Yeah, oh. definitely. And I like to think that maybe they are already talking to each other, but that is a good point to bring them in and. It doesn't hurt to get them down. It does there. not. No. No. no, I agree. And one thing that came up, I think it was in this work group as well, was really kind of trying to connect the dots and let them know of what other businesses are downtown as well, right? We're talking yes. about if someone new comes in and saying, oh, well, there's this hair salon downtown. There's also this place that's new downtown and just kind of but not bringing that business owner, but at least letting them know some of the- Know who's around them or what other like new businesses Perfect. have popped up. Yep. I, I, I totally agree, but enough is better than to have face-to-face -face contact oh, yeah. With, yeah. With, with the people that you're gonna be living with down there in downtown. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you know, that's, that's Definitely. why we do it. I will bring it back to them. Um, and then the last thing we were working on is obviously the Fund and Action Guide and the events that happen throughout uh, summertime. Um, so some of this has changed just a little bit. Brightside Cafe's one year celebration is now on June 1st, um, but Downtown Live is coming up, so that'll start in June and we have narrowed it down to six weeks instead of nine like we did last year and it is moved to Fridays from six to eight, uh, but it will still be on the Public Museum lawn. Um, and three dollars a ticket and then food truck Fridays will start on May 31st the farmers market has already kicked off and on Wednesdays and Saturdays and we are working with a couple other events stop and sips are still going on um, as well as sidewalk Saturdays in June really encouraging those businesses that have retail to kind of take over the sidewalks and showcase what they have to offer, have their doors open um, when it's nice out. We tried to do this last year in May and it rained every, every Saturday Every May. single Saturday. Um, so we're pushing it to June in hopes that maybe it will not rain as much. Um, so but just have, trying to I, utilize the street. I'm sorry, yeah. one more question. Uh, food Truck Fridays, is that gonna be done by the museum again? Children's Museum? Uh, yes, yeah, so it'll be in front of the okay. lodge pad. Yep, right. at, the, at the Pearl Street Park. Yep, mm -hmm. thanks. You're welcome. Um, and then we are doing our second annual art affair. We're already in the works with this. Um, the call to artists are already out. So any local artists, um, I guess anywhere around us really, who really wants to participate, it is free to participate. You have to register online to make sure that you have product that you can sell. Uh, food trucks will be there, live music will be there. This will also be um, in front of the public museum. Um, and the Ho-Chunk Center because the artists have relocated from the Benson Building to the Ho-Chunk Center. And so we're gonna really showcase that space, close down that street and help them um, utilize their sidewalks and bring people back down. It was a really big hit last year and the artists are already, have as soon as this ended last year, people were already asking to be a part of it again this year. Um, so really helping that call and making sure that everyone is happy and excited again. So that's all I got. That's all we have. You have questions? Dan, you look surprised. <laughs> any, any new things, Dan? No, thank you. No, excellent job. This, and this is very nice. Thank you. <clears throat> that was in your budget. Yes, it was. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll yeah, go well, to- Yeah, I can ask, Regan, one last thing that Dan and I were just talking just offline a little bit about with the list of events they had the Battery Park concerts on there, right? I saw it like Kane Brown yeah. and Country Fest and other ones. I think anyone that has been announced with. Well, this is a tough one to do because a lot of them are done, um, they're done in March. Yeah. Oh, You, exactly. have, you have to have them turned in by the beginning of March. If they were announced, they're on. Yes, yes. I just, we were on. So things page. have changed and been added and stuff since then, but. Okay. Fortunately. Thank you. it up electronically on the website, but yep. this one print material will be, will be in March. Thanks. Thank you. Citizen concerns, please come forward. State your name and address and your concern. <laughs> thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for your time. My name is Brent Rosenthal. To you guys, so I'll let you pass them on. And I am a resident at number five West Kings Highway. 
I am here to represent other residents from the West Kings Highway area along with Saddle Lane. The most recent resurfacing of West Kings Highway was completed back in 1994, 25 years ago. We have had several, several problems with our road, especially in the last couple of years. The city maintains the street by snow plowing, by sweeping, and every springtime they come and fill the potholes. It's just not working well. The potholes that they filled last week are already breaking down and starting to come apart. We have come before the city before. We've had mixed comments coming back. As a group, all the residents in our area got together and we put together a petition to try to see if we could get some help from the city. Uh, the city came back to us back in 2017 and the response was somewhat vague. And one of the biggest problems I see is we have about a half a dozen new uh, neighbors on the street that just moved in and all of a sudden they're facing the possibility of an assessment, having no prior knowledge that moving on to West Kings Highway would involve anything less than getting regular city uh, sponsored services. And every single new citizen that has moved there has asked why are we responsible to pay for this street? We just moved here in the last year or two. So on behalf of the residents, uh, we are asking the council to please take a peek, see if there's anything that can be done, and see if you could work with us and come up with some sort of solution that would work well for us. Uh, I'd like to invite one of our other neighbors up here to speak. She's a a new person on the street, having moved here in the last year. Hi, I'm Ann Winter. I just moved into 26 West Kings Highway um, a year ago, actually close to the day. Um, my husband and I are both born and raised in Sioux City. We decided to keep our family in Sioux City. We wanted a spot where our kids can run and play and not be worried about a street cars, most of they grew up on Cheyenne, where I can't let them out the front door without watching them. Uh, we found this house come up on the market. Um, lovely older couple lived there for, their, for years. Um, house needs a ton of work, I am not gonna lie. We bought it, we fell in love with the house, fell in love with the property. And all of a sudden we're pulled into a meeting saying that city wants to reassess us, to raise property taxes and you know, we lost our kind of, we kind of lost our mojo on the house for a little bit on that. We already are paying more than we thought. We, we know going into a house and a property the size that we had that our taxes would be higher. Um, but as a younger person, knowing that my friends have moved because the city taxes are higher, they have moved to newer houses outside of the city because they don't want to do the work. I'm one that wants to keep a property in Sioux City. I see a house that needs work and I want to keep it. It's only a benefit to the city. It's only a benefit to the community, only a benefit to my neighbors to repair a house on the block that's probably one of the two houses that needs the most work. Um, we have had a city assessor come through. We did get a, an abatement for 10 years on our taxes, but it doesn't mean they're not going to go up. They're going to go up, but it's just a help to improve our property. I don't mean, to be the young face on the block is kind of hard, but um, I mean, my family is close. My dad lives less than six blocks away. My mom is still on the west side. My husband's parents are still over by our old house off of Cheyenne. So it's, you know, I know the city infrastructure is old. I know roads need to be replaced all over. It's just, what's the difference with our taxes? Why can't we get a little help on a road that my kids can't ride a bike with training wheels without tipping over on? and get out to a sidewalk. Well, let me answer your question because I've uh, been affected by this personally. My street had asphalt down on it years ago and the city got tired of maintaining it. So what they did is they took a road grader to, to it, tore it all up and then we had chunks of the asphalt there for a while and they poured gravel on it. So when we did get around to finally paving the street, my neighbors, if you check the history, did get a 25% credit on the assessment, but they paid 
they paid for, I paid 100% because I didn't feel like sitting here, I should t take that 25%, which I wish now I would go back and rethink. But anyway, I paid and it's done. But that's the best deal that I know of anybody when they've had these type of streets. The, your property taxes do not pay for streets in the normal environment. When you move to a street, it's either paved or graveled and you accept that when you move to it. This was, I remember, unfortunately for some of you sitting there, I remember this in 1994, your road was a disaster even like it is today. And the city did one of those, well, we'll do a short term fix for you based upon what the cost could be that was, was acceptable to everybody. But I remember distinctly, we by no means said this is a city standard street and we by no means are going to accept that this is paving and we by no means are going to not do an assessment in the future. I was here, I remember it, unfortunately. I, some of you wish I was gone now, I know that. And some of you wish I was gone for other reasons, but that's the reality of this street. We did a few of them around town. It was never meant to be a permanent fix. Okay, and see, as, as a homeowner, we're not clearly stated as buying a home that anything was happening for us. So, you know, it's, when you walk into a house, you fall in love with the house, you fall in love with the property, you don't know anything else other than the fact that your road in is a little rough. I mean, I understand it's not a highly, thorough, it's not a thoroughfare, I mean, but there are residents that use it. Just the concern to us that, you know, it takes a fight to get a f hole fixed or a coat put on it. I mean, we've had to fight postal office to repair a mailbox now, so it's. I get it, I understand. Yeah. We, like I said, I went through this personally, so I understand. Can I ask a question too? I, if I, we've measured some of the other streets, Meadow Lawn and, and um, the other side of Kings Highway that's just east of Country Club Boulevard, and they're all very similar widths to West Kings Highway. So I guess we're trying to understand why our sh short street is different than some, some of the other ones have, in our area. Some of those actually have concrete under them, like, um, I, think, I think it's West Kings Highway. There's actually concrete under West Kings Highway with an asphalt overlay. That's the big difference. It was an acceptable standard of street when they build it. Today it wouldn't be. We would not accept that today. But it was an acceptable standard of street when we build it. So then we do maintain it either by an asphalt overlay or by fixing the potholes and that kind of stuff. That's that's a difference. Well, I, I think from our standpoint, in 1994 when the surface was put on, it's it's really had a great long life and shall till the last mm -hmm. couple of years when it's disintegrated. So I, I think that's a good life when something that's put in in 90, 1994. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mary Ellen, could yeah. you state your name and address oh, for, the, sorry. for the record? Yeah. No, Mary Ellen Hartman, and I live at 16 West Kings Highway. Um, so I, I, I think our concern for a lot of things, I look at the city of Sioux City and, and we have so many good amenities and we wanna keep those amenities. And interesting eclectic neighborhoods are what provide a, a city of interest. When we all travel, we like neighborhoods that are different and unique and, and people like Ann and our other five or six new members in the street have chosen West Kings Highway because of some of those amenities. As Ann said, she could have gone other places and spent the same amount of money with a, a home that was new and didn't need the work. They made this choice to, to stay there. So our, our concern is um, safety, for one, uh, and they filled the potholes again recently, which is helpful, but it still doesn't, doesn't take care of the problem. And I'm not sure that our street is currently on the roster to have anything done to it in the near future. Um, that's something Gordon? we... We'd like to know. It, it's not on the, in the plans? Uh, no, it is not. Uh, there's nothing on the plans except for waiting for a petition to come back in order to do an assessment. Because it won't come back to us just well, saying, oh, we're going to do this. And it's if, you, if you look at exhibit, I believe it's, it's exhibit three, that's right. the petition we were asked to sign. And, and Justin Potterf has been very good to work with. He sent that, emailed it to me asked me to circulate it, and if you'll read it, see if you as a neighbor would be interested in, in signing that petition. Here's a copy. It's exhibit three, I think, isn't it? What's or is that? It two? It's, it's, it's either exhibit Here's two or three. They're looking. Number yeah. three. It's the, yeah. Well, there's one that's signed. And the petition oh, that, is. Okay, I didn't. Mary Ellen, you're talking about the petition. Yes, the <laughs> petition itself. Oh, hold on. As I said, it, it we had some momentum going. That came to me, and I, I just thought we this well, this is like I'm signing a blank check. Mm -hmm. okay, look at the petition. Absolutely. 
I just have a question. My, my name is Stuart Hartman. I'm with Mary Ellen. When you look at the standards for city paving and stuff like that, is there any regard to the differences in traffic that they handle? And I might, um, Mr. Scott said the street in front of him, that's a pretty busy street that comes out of, of uh, uh, Leeds. And then we recently in our neighborhood had Country Club, new, I think it was new, new sewer and the whole thing. I don't know what the, the traffic count on Country Club would be, but there's only two ways out of the whole neighborhood. And so Country Club's a pretty busy street. West Kings Highway doesn't get too much traffic. It's a dead end road. And so whether or not the city takes into consideration the standards for what kind of traffic count you have for the type of uh, uh, overlay. You know, I was here listening to the 27% over however many dollars that was for that project. I know that the city isn't just oozing with money. It seems like if, if an asphalt overlay would last another 22, 25 years, our street would be appropriate to consider it. So thank you very much. When, remember when they did my road, though, everybody said you're just paving the mayor's road? I, I, you know, Bob, I, I was sitting thinking here, now, there isn't much <laughs> new that you haven't heard, but I held my tongue, and uh, no, no I, do, saying, I do, I do, I do. When they paved my road, everybody yeah. said that. Oh, yeah, and probably if you'd have taken the 25%. I paid. should have, because yeah. I took enough heat for it. Because they still gave it. And, I, and now to try to back out of my driveway when West High and West Middle, or North High and oh, yeah. North Middle are going to school, it's your life in your own hands. because you, you know, it was coincidence. I went over, you know, Outer Belt uh, Drive to work this morning. At the same time, I thought, I've never seen this much traffic it's in Susie because I don't come over there. But, but anyway, our, our road is not that heavily traveled. I don't know if it takes a variance from the city engineer, <laughs> but we just would request a consideration. How wide is the road today? Pardon me? How wide, How wide is the road today? It's about 18 feet. This petition would state, it, state that it goes from 18 feet in width to 24 feet. And then is the eight is the full depth eight inch asphalt reconstruction, is that different overlay, asphalt overlay that they're talking about? Uh, I'm not sure what you An mean. asphalt overlay versus this eight, full depth eight inch asphalt reconstruction. Are you gonna yeah, mill the What they're asking for is just like a, a, like a two inch overlay, which yes, oh. of course it would be much cheaper, but it, it won't last. Yes. Are you talk, so you're talking about leaving it down, or you're talking about milling it up and starting over? Yeah, it, it, because of the drainage problems there. That, if that you do it an overlay, be, it's just gonna continue to erode. Right, so well, it would have to be taken up, some uh, gra um, base put down, compacted, uh, base put down, and then, uh, then the asphalt overlay. Could you mill it and then put a six inch overlay on it? But yes. If you mill again, it, you're, you'll still have to remove that, kind of, sure. you know. Right, if you treat, mill it, you take it base. all up, so you know. If, if he's milling it, he's gonna take it down to the original road bit, like you had before when they laid the asphalt down. Yeah, it was fly ash, um, originally Brower fly ash was put down and then the It'll all the be surface. treated, but then what, we also have to look at the drainage at that point too, because mm -hmm. when you're adding six inches of asphalt, it creates problems elsewhere. We, under, we understand that, and I think you're, you're not doing curb and gutter, though, right? We appreciate the drainage concern. It's already half curb and gutter. Well, not half, but I'd say a quarter curb and gutter there now. Oh, really? Yeah, down at the cul-de-sac, it's curb and gutter, and then I think yeah. one or two homes also have it along that stretch. On the west west edge. Yes. So you're going to put curb in where it doesn't have it then? Yes. That's that increases the cost then accordingly, doesn't it? Oh yes. Yeah. As opposed to, and you're doing the curb and gutter because of the drainage, because isn't it, wouldn't it drain? Well, we're not doing anything at this point. If you I mean, were to. If yeah. we were to, we would do curb and gutter yet. But, but can't we just do the overlay without the curb and gutter? And could you pitch it just to the north? There's, there's, there's a drainage system on the north edge. Well, there's not, there's not the much of a bit. drainage system, no, but right? There's a system it's, there it goes right up against a hill. So drainage would have to be improved along that. Yeah. But I think could you do that without curb and gutter and, and pitch it that way and imp improve that drainage? I think everything's possible. Because what he's it's saying, not recommended. Yeah, he's I mean, saying it, that's possible, it, but it's just it would be, more bad money. We, we, we could do, do it that, do right. but again, it still wouldn't be acceptable as, as part of our standards. Right, correct. 
You're, we're talking two different things here. Yeah, but we're also fixing potholes and we, we I've never, I don't want to, I'll say this nicely to you, but on these small streets, I, I have just a little bit of problem that we have to have, and, I, and don't give me that suit ass crap because I've driven other towns, so I know that's what you're gonna tell me. Suit ass wouldn't accept that. I just wonder how they get away with it in other towns. They can, they can have de design exceptions in with their supplements as well as ours. So have you gotten an estimate of what just two inches or just six inches of asphalt would be? I mean, we ought to have a pretty good idea. We just bid a project, or three of them. That it's all by the ton. It's not magic to what that, in fact, it should be reasonably cheap. Have you well, there's, there's more to it than just milling it and grading it, but uh, no, I haven't, we haven't done an estimate for that other than just doing a full on eight inch. Paving? Paving with curb and gutter, fixing the drainage. Widening. Widening. So that's what this estimate is then? 500,000, yeah. Uh, almost 590,000. Could we get an estimate of what it would be just, how do we get to the six inches? Question went from eight inches to? That's just one of our standards. We're going with that six because inches. that's what it will take okay, to so, last so, that long. So here's the deal, we, we can talk about this all day long, but what we really want to know is who's going to pay for it and how nice do we want this road? So that's, that's where it's at. What? No, you're fine, I was just gonna see that paper. I don't know. Well, you can check the history of. I mean, that's what it comes down to, so. I'm, I'm reasonably certain, not that there's an agreement in the file, but I'm reasonably certain that when this was put in, it was pretty clear to the neighbors that it was not something the city long term was. How would how would how would residents know that or or someone? Oh, these were you people there just then? Have, um, were you there in ninety four? We were the young people then. Eighty four. <laughs> now we're the old. Hold folks. it. It's eighty four, not ninety four. But but, but this, I, was, this was the Byron Brower. He did Plum Creek Road. He did a bunch of these up in his neighborhood. I think that was prior to 94. That was a that was fly 84, ash. But okay, that's that even worse ash. because I, get, okay. I guarantee you yeah, that's we Byron Browers. If they put fly ash down in asphalt, yes. I guarantee you then that was no maintenance on that. If that's where, if that's one of those projects, Plum Creek has the same problem, right? I mean, not a mystery to you guys, but. And I, I, I again, I'm referring to really you, any you of us on the street. That. It's not part of our <clears throat> abstract, the nope. city, plows it, they sweep, they sweep the gravel off, then they come and do the potholes um, when they get bad enough. How, how would anyone looking and buying a home on our street know that? Um, we, we moved in in 1985 and, and we don't have anything that would even make us aware of that or remind us of, of that. And I, 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 and I think one of the- Back in the early days, they had signs up that said that. Put them right at the entrance. It's, uh, this road was a pilot project of the city, of Sioux City and Brower Asphalt. I remember that on Plum Creek Road like it was yesterday. And they put that up and they made it very clear that there was just a pilot project of that company. But I, I, I believe on our road, Bob, that there, fly ash was a, a factor and then the surface was put on in 1994, the, the current asphalt surface that's there. Well, if you did which it again has served there, us very well. The if you did it in 94, there's a resolution that clearly spelled out, I bet, that said that it's not, like you wouldn't have it on your abstract. But and again, how would, let's say it was your son that had bought a home in this street, how, how would a homeowner know in Sioux City these things? Well, if what there I was, was gonna an say, assessment, go ahead. If there was an assessment that was spread on the properties, it would have been recorded and would be part of the abstract for the title chain. But I don't know if there was an assessment yeah. that was ever done or if it was by agreement. I would have I, to I research that. I don't believe so. I don't think any of us have anything like that. Okay, so, so this paper, yeah. This paper that I passed out to everyone, it says right on there that, that you were assessed. You gave the years and, and it was <coughs> this property owner. So if you guys want to, Rhonda, it's on the front. But I don't well, know if it's on the Then there should have been a recorded record. It's on not on the title. abstract. All of them. It was, Dan, uh, Dave Carney did an inner informational memo on May 1st that I'm, yeah, that's I'm getting, is that what that is? <coughs>
Have you seen that, Gordon? The memo? Yes. Yeah. Is that any, that's not any different than what you, remember you researched it earlier that, this year for exactly me? That's exactly the memo. Yeah, we did last day. Yeah. I, then I sent that out to, Remember they the letter in, I sent out to you earlier in, this year? They moved in in 85, there wouldn't have been because they would have had to clean the title up because that would have shown as a lien against the property. Right. Mr. Carlson, always good to have you in the house. Uh, my name is Ted Carlson. <clears throat> I live at 401 West Kings Highway. We've been there 37 okay. years. Does that make sense to me? Uh, it is not on the abstract. My question is, two years ago we had a meeting that one of the gentlemen from the city came out and said, well, we can do this or we'll get it done and nothing had been done. My question is, the city won't do anything about it. Can we personally have that overlight? Do you plan to for yourself? Yeah. We can do it for half of what this is because we've had two different outfits out there and looked at it. Well, part, uh, part of the difference, I think, though, I think, probably did the six inch from the other companies that might have come out and you're not doing the, you're not widening it and. No, no, we're going, but. And not curb and gutter, well, no, I, I The understand. curb and gutter is there from the top of the hill all the way down to the cul-de-sac. That's been in since we've been there. <coughs> and I've been there longer Why than do we anybody care in the do? room. I don't care if they do. I don't. Yeah, I wouldn't care. If we could get the thing done for half of what this is, uh, the complaint has been, or what we were told, well, you can't get asphalt trucks in there or they can't bring their asphalt equipment across that bridge. That bridge will stand up to whatever you want to put on it. Sure. The okay. bridge is due, yes, the bridge is due for replacement. The load limit. Why, why wouldn't you, limitation. instead of building a bridge across it, why not put in a big culvert? That, uh, that's what we'll be doing. That creek does not have enough water in it to. That, and that's what it'll be. It'll be a box culvert, but it'll still take a couple of weeks to do that. I mean, it's it's will, out of it's out a couple years. Will the city do that? I'm sorry, what? Will the city go as far as a bridge and put that bridge in? Just Save replace the, box. the bridge, yes. You will. Yeah, we're paying for the box if, it, if it's. Nothing. It's in the CIP project now. Yes. How far out? Uh, I want two years. Yeah, I think two years. It, I mean, unless you go down there and drive that road, you won't believe it. My I, wife I went can't down drive that road. it, she's afraid to drive it. I, I, I thought for sure I was gonna get lost and no one will ever, ever find me again. <laughs> I'm telling you, there are some big holes there, so. <laughs> I think you had a bunch of cats, didn't you? <laughs> See? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I totally get it because I, I was on, I went out there when I got a phone call from Dave, I think. And. When was the last time you happened to drive down? Oh, about, probably a month ago. Okay, did you see what happened to our mailboxes? No, uh-uh. Could you, could you, you gotta come to the microphone. Could you come yeah. to the podium? Yeah, she, can't, the she can't get up, that's why she's sitting there. She can't, okay. Well, she can. Well, it just won't pick it up on the record, that's all. It's my oh. wife, that's Mary Jo Carls. Yeah. How'd they get knocked over? How'd they get knocked over? We don't know, somebody slid into it. With a truck or something, and they were nice enough to let you know. They were down on the banks of the Perry Creek, so we wanted to get your mail that first couple of days you had a problem in there. Oh my God. My, my question back is. Back to your question. Okay, if, if you do the bridge, up to the bridge, or the bridge, you're gonna put in a box. If the city does that. Can we go from there down with an overlay as a group, if we pay for it? Gordon, is there any Because apparently you're not going to. No, I think, I didn't say that. We're going to participate. You always have to participate. Never enough money in an assessment that the homeowners pay for everything. I thought you could find that, Bob. You're so the city, find, city I always in an assessment hearing has to pay for it. Plus you can't assess storm sewer, can you? You just assess the paving. 
Oh, I don't think there's any storm sewer. Okay. Anyway, you, sure. the city normally is short because you don't have enough valuation on these big lots to justify it. Uh, two questions. Um, would would that require some sort of a of a petition or some sort of a declaration by the council that you approved? We don't need your home. signatures to do a paving assessment. No paving. Or, no, guys, no, no. But I mean, if we were, guys, if we're going to pay pay for part of it or something like, but not a. And the second one was a variance as far as the the 24 feet, Bob, and that sort oh, of thing. That would take council action. And the second one is. Kind of at the end of this, where do we go from here, collectively? Right. And, and I would echo what Brent said. Thank you very, very much for all the time that you've afforded us in this discussion, because I know you're valuable. Your time is valuable, so thank you. Well, this has well, been going on for long, for too long, so I, I think we need to come to some kind of conclusion. So, if they were to do it on their own, it would be no different than it is now. I mean, it, we wouldn't maintain it other than filling a pothole. And right. plowing it and sweeping that. So. Yes, exactly. Which is what's being maintained right now. Correct. Could you restate that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. I said if that was to if that was to be done, it would have to it would continue on like it is now, where we wouldn't maintain it. I mean, we we would only be doing the sweeping and the plowing and fixing a pothole. Right. Other than that, um, I but I think the drainage, if they were to add asphalt to that drainage should be looked at on how it's going to adversely affect other properties along that route because we'll be the first ones to get called out there if if the water's not draining and it's flooding out someone's driveway or house you know if, if we got bob did you say 25 percent that that's probably what the city would have to pay 25 percent is the maximum assessment based on the valuation of the properties that the city can spread property owner would pay. Okay, yes. Could, could we look at this as a, a cooperative effort and perhaps a variation from what the, the standards would be because of the, the, the length of the street, it's not ever gonna be a through street. Um, and we would like to have the city continue maintaining it. Uh, and could we look at a cooperative effort and give the council maybe time to think about this and, and see what we could get done? You know, it depends on what you mean by maintain. You, you, we'd, we'd still do the potholes if they yes. come back. And, nothing would nothing would change there. If so, if we would go ahead with the the plan that the petition that we were to sign that that we weren't sure what we signed, but if we had signed that, would and then it would have been an assessed situation. Would you have then maintained the quality of the street? Yes. In perpetu perpetuity. That's yeah. that, that that cost that you have was to bring it up to our standards so the street would become ours to maintain forever. And it's, it, you can pay over 10 years, by the way. I'm not that that helped light, I mean, not that makes you feel any better, but you can pay for it over 10 years. And I, I think part of it now, what we were discussing is, I'm not sure we all agree that we need the curve and, and gutter and the, the street width, the 24 it, width that- But if that's on, that's if, if we're bringing it up to our standards, right. Right. That's what we're going to do. So could we have a, um, could the council and the neighborhood look at perhaps a compromise and um, a variance from those standards and uh, a cooperative effort on the assessment portion? Well, I'm gonna ask Pete and Rhonda, because we've got a mayor's youth commission at six. I'm not trying to limit discussion, but I do want you to know that. Uh, they're on the engineering committee. And so maybe you guys should like, they met today Maybe we should give you an hour there. You guys meet for an hour or two. Well, hour, uh, yeah, if hour and 15 minutes, but the next meeting is? Two weeks. Two June, weeks. no, no, in two weeks, yeah, okay, from today. Yes. May you have, 20th. You have a full agenda on that already? No. Why don't you have, why don't you appoint four or five people from your neighborhood to come? I'm sorry, I'm not feeling very good today. Point four or five neighbors to come and give give Gordon the name of the contact person that then Rhonda and Pete can meet with you and try to come to some middle ground. Thank you very much. Thank we you. tried to have coffee with you, but I heard you quit doing coffee because nobody came. So That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, definitely we can start that up again. Good, good, pre it's, it's, good. Pre it's May twentieth. Thanks again for your time. So who's oh, who's the contact person? They're yeah, like Gordon, no. give Gordon, Gordon. A, a name to. He'll give names to Gordon. Okay. Yep, and, and and he'll let you know what time to come and. Uh.
I'll go from there. Rhonda, then we have one more person. Just one statement. Yeah. My name is Jane Merritt, and I live at 20 West Kings Highway, and about the bridge, we just redid our driveway with concrete, and standard would not go over the bridge. The people that put the uh, driveway in for us, very long driveway, used little bobcats to bring the concrete. Little concrete buggies. Yeah, we, it's substandard buggies. Just so, I mean, three years, if anyone else is planning on doing any work, that's all, thank you. Thank you. That is a caveat. We, this may not happen until that bridge is replaced. Yeah. Only because there's no trucks that'll go across. Well, well let's, get, let's get an update on where that is before Monday too, okay? All right. Thanks, Gordon. Thank, thank you, guys. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you, guys, for coming. Yep, thank you. Anyone else? Good job. Heard? Council concerns. Well, I had a couple of things I was going to share. I think I can take up a couple of them with the city manager, but real quickly. She just sent me a uh, I attended the meeting along with Alex, uh, the MPO policy board uh, meeting a week before last, and, and, and I just wanted to share some of the comments that Dakin Schultz gave us with respect to Interstate 29. And I wrote as fast as I could write, but, but so I could share with you. Uh, Dakin said, uh, told the board at the meeting that day that he was relatively certain that uh, the interstate will be done in 2019. Uh, he said the contractors are putting a lot of work into it. Everything's going pretty well. He indicated Floyd closure. Uh, Floyd is cl will be closed until <coughs> June 1st. <coughs> Pierce Street should open July 4th. Virginia Street to follow Floyd uh, closure and then reopening on June 1st, I believe. He also talked about Hamilton Boulevard. Uh, the on-ramp will be closed. It has been closed May 1st. It'll last for 28 days. Hopefully that'll be done by Memorial Day. Uh, So the, he also talked a little bit about the Gordon Drive Vidoc. He said they're doing a study right now and have an environmental analyst working on it. Uh, he said the project is about 10 years out though. He said they are going to try to determine if we can do something other than just one long bridge. There is a May 21st public meeting at 5 p.m. Um, at the convention center. And then he said uh, they were going to plan on setting up a stakeholders meeting, which would include the city council, the chamber, and downtown partners. So he was uh, re really optimistic about getting off of the street uh, or off of the interstate and having the job completed for the most part in, in 2019. He did say something about having to come back next summer and raise, and maybe Alex remembers, raise uh, Hamilton Boulevard so entertained it. Doesn't it so it doesn't flood like yeah, that. They're, they're two and a half feet lower than That's they should they're be. That's raising the bridge so yeah. they can raise the street. But, but hopefully, those are some of the key dates. I just wanted to make sure we, we could share that, and I think the rest of it I can share with Bob. And Pete, thanks for going to that meeting. Yeah, you're welcome, sir. You're welcome. Available. So thank you. Alex. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> no, I can share what I have next week. I'm fine. No, next. No, it's okay. All right. What about Washington? Are, are that's, yeah, well, about that's, that's what I was going to. That's fine. I was going to. It's a huge trip. <laughs> yeah, I was going to mention oh, yeah. some of the. Got a lot done. <laughs> then, uh, Quite a bit. Yeah, no, I would say um, some of the things most pertinent that we, in discussions that we had, number one was Senator Ernst put forth a bill talking about the portability of the uh, housing vouchers <laughs> for Section 8. Uh, hopefully it will get some traction, but we were bringing it up with our different senators as well, just letting them know that that legislation was going forward because $18,000 a month is going out of our community. Oftentimes back to Chicago, it's something that I forget how many hundreds of thousands of dollars are lost across the state, that specifically with Sioux City. So Senator <laughs> Ernst is putting that forward. We also had a good discussion. Mm -hmm. um, something that I was particularly proud of was um, some of our corporate leaders discussing immigration and the, the need for not migration across the country, but also immigration. 
Uh, I, I did not bring it up, but I'm always astonished when the president says things like the country is full. Um, when we have a lot of people that would love to hire and we need additional workforce. And so it was great to see some of our corporate leaders out there talking about the need for people to fill the jobs that we have um, and doing so in a legal, productive manner. Um, any meaningful legislation to reform the immigration system would be very welcomed. Okay. That was another topic that was discussed. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that fell on deaf ears, but I think that they understand our plight that, that uh, Unemployment is 2.4% or 2.5%, and so it's something that we really, especially in this side of the state, need to address. So, lots of great conversation, but that's that's all I'll update. There were a lot of other topics as well, but. I just Thank wanna, you for going. I just want to add the Washington, D.C. trip was, a, it was successful. It really was, and the other. I really do appreciate it. Well, the other outstanding, there's an agency, Department of Transportation, and they were very attentive. They did their homework. They knew what was going on in Sioux City, and they're very uh, positive about the, the build funding, and, and we talked about Hooven Drive, and, and uh, yeah. we did a good job of bringing that before them as well, and of course, the workforce development. It's really good because, especially with the agencies like Department of Transportation, the, the in-person meeting is very important, I think, and then meeting with the senators and representatives is also important. So I thought, I thought it went real well. It was, uh, uh, we're on a tight time frame. It was good. And the briefing by the White House staff, I thought uh, those two individuals were really knowledgeable and, and really thought us a lot. No, they did. They opened. And then lastly, I just want to say we, we had the Rose Hill splash pad dedication this past weekend and, and it, it, with a firefighters theme. It was fantastic. Great addition to the community, <coughs> to that neighborhood. And uh, I just wanted to let you know how well that went as well. That's all I have, Mayor. I just had one thing. It's like the fourth or fifth year I've attended that Casa breakfast. Oh, yeah. They're court appointed uh, yeah. advocates for young people in foster care. Mm -hmm. There's a need. We have about 500 and some kids in foster care between Plymouth and Woodgate County. We only have like 150 CASAs. So if you know of anybody that might be interested in that, spread the word. Absolutely. I move we adjourn. In second. <clears throat> More? Made it. Uh, aye. Scott? Aye. Waters? Aye. Capron? Aye. Brickin? Aye. Who's supposed to stay? Uh, it's at seven. But yeah, six, yeah. isn't it? Seven. Seven. Are we invited? Is that something? Yes. Yeah, we're going to invite them. It's on our schedule. Is or, that Young Ambassadors at seven? Oh, I thought it was six.